I'm honored to be here uh, and to be able to introduce today's speaker, John Sopko. Mr. Sopko is currently serving as the United States Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, also known as SIGR, an office that Congress created in 2008 to investigate waste, fraud, and abuse in U.S. reconstruction programs in Afghanistan. Mr. Sopko began his career as a state prosecutor in Cleveland in the 1970s, at a time when Cleveland was the bombing capital of the United States, plagued by arson, shootings, missing persons, and bombings. He soon moved to the Organized Crime Strike Force at the U.S. Department of Justice, where he brought the nation's first successful RICO prosecution against the leaders of an American La Cosa Nostra crime family, investigating, indicting, and eventually convicting James Jack White Lacavoli and his principal lieutenants, which effectively ended the mafia's reign in that city. Starting in 1982, Mr. Sopko spent more than 20 years conducting investigations on Capitol Hill, moving from the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations to the Select Committee on Homeland Security and finishing up as Chief Counsel for Oversight and Investigations at the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. His investigations for those committees covered such diverse topics as health insurance, critical infrastructure, post-Soviet weapons proliferation, enforcement of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, cybersecurity, counterterrorism, government procurement fraud, and the illegal export of dual-use technologies. After a brief retirement in the private sector, where he was a partner for three years at the law firm of Aiken, Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld, Mr. Sopko re-entered public service in 2012 when President Barack Obama appointed him to the office he now holds. During the first two years alone of his service of inspe as Inspector General, Mr. Sopko recouped or saved $256 million, and referrals from his investigations resulted in 42 criminal convictions. Please join me in welcoming Inspector General John Sopko. Oh, that's right. That's right. He remembered. It's so difficult. It is, right? It is. Well, thank you very much for that kind uh, introduction and, and going down memory lane on all of the uh, issues. Basically, I can't keep a job, so that's it. But uh, I also want to thank uh, especially uh, the Maxwell School, uh, Dean Van Slyke, uh, Professor Denevers, for giving me the opportunity to come back to Syracuse to speak again about my little agency with that tobacco-sounding acronym, SIGAR, Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, and what we have done to identify fraud, waste, and abuse in what has become our 18-year-long longest war and where we have spent $136 billion on reconstruction. Now, but before addressing some of the work we have done and some of the lessons from that, I think it's duty, I'm duty-bound to sort of talk about the 600-pound the gorilla in the room, and that is peace. As many of you realize, or maybe not, that uh, recently, actually on February 29th, uh, I happened to be there at, uh, in Kabul at the time, uh, a peace agreement was signed by our government and uh, the Taliban. And the potential withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan may occur within the next 14 months. Now, the jurisdiction, and I can go back in the Q&A or at the end I will come back to the peace agreement, uh, but our jurisdiction doesn't cover the peace agreement. It only extends to reconstruction, and we are not part of that peace negotiation, nor can I uh, opine officially on the warfighting or broader foreign policy implications of it. However, I can say uh, from talking to not only U.S. government officials, but Afghan officials and uh, colleagues in Afghanistan, that there is cautious optimism for the first time in a number of years. Uh, but also an acknowledgement, and I hope all of you follow the press, I think it's important that in these early days uh, we closely follow what happens and closely follow what the Taliban 
and the Afghan government do uh, and make certain that they are committed to intra-Afghan uh, negotiations. Um, as I said, I'll come back and talk to Peace, and I hopefully there will be some questions regarding that at the end of my presentation. But in 2019, we did have some, I would say, influence on the peace negotiations. We issued what we call our high risk list. Every inspector general does that every two years with the new Congress coming in, in which we lay out what are the risks that you, the new Congress, will face. This was the first high risk list that we did where we talked about, for a change, the risks of reconstruction, but also the risks in reconstruction and how it would affect peace. Because two years ago, there was talk about peace. So we listed key eight key areas of reconstruction effort that had to be taken in mind for lasting peace. And that will be part of my discussion today. I'll be going into those. In the meantime, uh, I'd like to specifically also talk today about our Lessons Learned program. Um, during my last visit here in 2016, I actually talked about our first Lessons Learned report, and that examined U.S. anti-corruption efforts in Afghanistan. So four years later, with six additional Lessons Learned reports and a Washington Post series uh, that uh, highlighted them, I'm eager to discuss the successes and failures that SIGAR has identified in the reconstruction effort in Afghanistan. I'm sure in that regards, all of you know that Afghanistan still remains one of the most corrupt, poorest, and insecure countries in the world. Afghanistan's security force and civilian casualties are at an all-time high, and to date, over 2,300 U.S. servicemen and women have given their lives in Afghanistan. In addition to the Taliban threat, there are as many as 20 other terrorist groups operating in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region, including ISIS. An example of how bad that threat is is that because of widespread security threats for the past several years, all U.S. civilian personnel, including myself and my staff, arriving in Afghanistan have been required to fly via U.S. helicopter from the international airport to the embassy, a mere three kilometers. Because that distance, the Afghan security forces, of which we've pay, given them $86 billion, is unable to protect that three-kilometer road. And if the daily threat of violent attack isn't enough to deal with, as I noted, SIGAR and other areas, agencies also face the challenge of working in one of the most corrupt countries on the planet. Afghanistan ranks 173rd out of 180 countries on Transparency International's most recent Corruption Perception Index, and 91% of Afghans recently surveyed state that corruption is a problem in their daily lives. Now, reconstruction is a large, lengthy, and difficult undertaking in any country. But the pervasive insecurity and corruption plaguing Afghanistan have se severely inhibited our efforts and the successes we have made and also made it difficult to do oversight. Now, but despite having one of the toughest oversight tasks, I think, of any agency in the U.S. government, SIGAR has achieved some significant accomplishments for you, the taxpayer. Uh, before, but before I talk about SIGAR's specific oversight accomplishments, you may be wondering, what is an inspector general? I'm assuming you know. Uh, don't feel bad, however, if you don't. Many people don't know what an inspector general is generally, or a special inspector general especially. 
And I found that among even generals and ambassadors and other high government officials over the last eight years. In 2008, Congress created SIGAR, the little agency, as I said, with that tobacco-sounding acronym to combat waste, fraud, and abuse in reconstruction in Afghanistan. Because we were at that time spending more money in Afghanistan on reconstruction than we did on the entire Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe. And Congress felt, because of allegations reported in the press and that they were picking up, that they needed one specialized, dedicated agency to look at that reconstruction investment. Like all other independent federal inspectors general, SIGAR has auditing and criminal enforcement responsibilities. But unlike the other 73 federal inspector generals, SIGAR is not housed within any one government agency. Now this may be kind of boring, but that's very important. Because we have the only authority of any federal inspector general to look beyond one agency. There's a DOD inspector general, but he can only look at DOD. There's a Justice Department inspector general, but he can only look at the at, at G DOJ. AIDS the same, state and all that. We can look at the whole of government doing reconstruction in Afghanistan, as well as the whole of governments working on reconstruction in Afghanistan. And this is critical because when you deal with development in a post-conflict area, you are in Afghanistan as well as in the future anywhere else going to be dealing with multiple U.S. government agencies multiple foreign agencies, agencies such as NATO or the European Union or other entities. So it's important to have that a unique ability to conduct oversight of any federal U.S. dollar spent, even if it's going to the World Bank, the UN, or Asian Development Bank. To date, we have published nearly 600 audits, inspections, and other reports that have resulted in cost savings of over $3 billion and convicted 130 individuals for misconduct. As I mentioned before, our work has also resulted in seven lessons learned reports, which I'd like to discuss. I know as bright young Syracuse students, you all have watched or read about the Washington Post series in early December entitled The Afghanistan Papers. Well, basically I can say I'm the father of the Afghanistan Papers because uh, Craig Whitlock and his team at the Washington Post based most of that work on the work of SIGAR and particularly on the work of our Lessons Learned program and based it on the raw interview notes that he FOIA'd under the Freedom of Information Act that we provided to the Washington Post. In light of his attention, I would like to tell you a little bit about that Lessons Learned program, how it came about, why it's important, what it does, and what it doesn't do, uh, and, and give you some of the major themes that we have uh, identified from our work. Our Lessons Learned program almost goes back to the beginning when I started. At that time, in 2012 and 2013, we kept producing audits, inspections, and investigations that would reveal ugly problems. Buildings that melted, airplanes that couldn't fly, roads that collapsed, bridges that didn't work, and drug trafficking growing, ghost soldiers, ghost police that were paying salaries to. It was a boringly constant drumbeat of failures we were identifying. But almost every time we presented one of these reports, some general, some ambassador, or some congressman would ask me this question. So Sopko, what does it mean? You keep turning out these horror stories. What does it mean to me as a policymaker? What can I learn from one more bad audit 
or bad investigation or bad report you issued. And that got me to thinking. After 18 years, or almost 18 years at that time, we really weren't fighting an 18-year war and trying to understand it. We were fighting 18 one-year wars because of our rotation of troops, ambassadors, and aid officials. And I was frustrated that none of our agencies were trying to answer the question, what does this all mean for development, for war fighting, counterterrorism, et cetera? In an attempt to get agencies to be thinking about lessons and best practices, in 2013, I sent a letter. I'm just a simple country lawyer. I sent a letter to the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, the administrator for USAID, and asked a simple question. What's worked and what hasn't? And why? I particularly asked for your top 10 successes in Afghanistan and your bottom 10 failures. But more importantly, how did you judge them that? Judge them. What criteria did you use? Well, I sent that letter twice. First time, didn't get an answer. Second time, got some interesting answers but didn't answer the mail. The answers received were informative, but they failed to specifically identify 10 top programs and 10 least successful. So I sent another letter, and I said, well, hold it, maybe 10 is too difficult. Just give me some. And it sort of explain why. You here at Syracuse who are doing this research, you want to know why things are said to work and why they fail. In doing that, you can protect the taxpayer dollar and maybe you can improve your work in the future. Well, none, either their inability or refusal to do so, not only limited my understanding, but also Congress's understanding of what worked, what didn't, and how do we improve things. So, in some ways, I want to be fair to the agencies. Um, their reluctance to list their successes and failures is understandable. As the old saying goes, success has many fa parents, but failure is an orphan. Nowhere is that truer than in Afghanistan, where success is fleeting and failure is common. That is all the more reason why I was urged by a number of officials, including General Allen, who was our Supreme Commander, and Ambassador Ryan Crocker, who had been ambassador here in Afghanistan, as well as in Iraq, that somebody who can look at the whole of government should develop a lessons learned program. Because remember, we are the only agency in the U.S. government, with the exception of the National Security Council, who could look at the whole of government and issue lessons learned reports. So in response to that, we started the lessons learned program in 2014. Now, our lessons learned program, which is limited to looking at only reconstruction, was not, despite what the Washington Post may say, and was never intended to be a new version of the Pentagon Papers. Nor was it to turn snappy one-liners and quotes into headlines or sound bites. My staff were not trying to win a Pulitzer. We do not make also broad assessments of U.S. diplomatic and military strategies or the war fighting, nor does our lessons learned report focus on the ultimate question, should we be in Afghanistan or not? Those are policy issues. IGs such as I don't look at the policy issues, we look at the process. Rather, as I said, our Lessons Learned program is, to, is intended and has produced seven unclassified, publicly available, and thoroughly researched appraisals that meet auditing standards on important aspects of U.S. reconstruction efforts in Afghanistan, as well as to make actionable recommendations to Congress and the executive branch, something that the Washington Post didn't do in their series, and you know, it wasn't their job, it's ours. Our goal for the program and our reports is to turn lessons observed into, by policymaker, excuse me, by SIGAR into lessons learned by policymakers. 
so that future reconstruction efforts are more effective. Now, in order for you to understand the breadth of topics that SIGAR Lessons Learned program covers, let me briefly discuss the seven reports in a little more detail that we have issued to date. All of these reports can be found on our website, www.sigar.mil, in both the full and interactive format. Our first Lessons Learned report, Corruption and Conflict, published in 2016, found that corruption substantially undermined the U.S. mission in Afghanistan. And unfortunately, the U.S. helped with the corruption problem. The lesson is that anti-corruption efforts need to be at the center of planning and policy makers, policy making for contingencies like Afghanistan. Our second report, published in 2017, entitled Reconstructing the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces, revealed that the U.S. government was ill-prepared to help build an Afghan army and police force capable of protecting Afghanistan. We found that the U.S. government lacked a comprehensive approach and coordinating body to successfully implement the whole of government programs there. In April 2018, we published our third report, Private Sector Development and Economic Growth, which found that early economic successes in Afghanistan were undermined by ongoing physical insecurity and political instability, which discouraged investment. Our fourth report, Stabilization, was published in May of 2018 and revealed that we greatly overestimated our ability to build and reform government institutions in Afghanistan and that reconstruction programs were not tailored for Afghanistan, were hampered by unrealistic timelines, and successes rarely lasted longer than the physical presence of coalition troops. Counter-narcotics was the subject of our fifth report, published in June 2018. We found then that no program, no, and this is important, no program led to lasting reductions in poppy cultivation or opium production. In June 2019, our sixth report, Divided Responsibility, highlighted the difficulty of coordinating the whole of government security sector assistance during active combat and under the umbrella of a 39-member NATO coalition when no specific DOD organization or military service was assigned ultimate responsibility for U.S. efforts. And last fall, our seventh report, Reintegration of Ex-Combatants, examined the five main post-2001 efforts to integrate or reintegrate former combatants into Afghan society. We found that successful reintegration is a key to peace, but that our prior efforts did not help in any significant way. In addition to these seven reports, we plan to issue two more reports this year, one on elections in Afghanistan, which in light of the fact we now have two presidents in Afghanistan, they're arguing over who won, uh, sounds important. And the second one will be on monitoring and evaluation of US government contracts. We expect to issue reports on women empowerment and another one on police and corrections in uh, 2021. So, what, and I have them somewhere, there's a stack of yay thick, almost a, a, uh, uh, a foot in documents, if you want to hold those up. Uh, don't hurt yourself. <laughs> All the reports. What have we learned from the over 1,700 pages of uh, reports? We've actually learned quite a bit. But there are six overarching conclusions from our lessons learned reports and SIGAR's other work I'd like to just briefly mention. The first one is successful reconstruction is incompatible with continuing insecurity. It just doesn't work. And, or if it does, it's extremely difficult and extremely expensive. The second one, Conclusion is that unchecked corruption 
in Afghanistan undermined U.S. strategic goals. And as I mentioned before, the U.S. helped to foster that corruption. Unintentionally, but we did. Third was after the Taliban's initial defeat, there was no clear reconstruction strategy and no single military service, agency, or nation in charge of reconstruction, which hindered success. Fourth conclusion was that politically driven timelines undermined the reconstruction effort. Fifth is that if we cannot end this problem of short rotations of our personnel, or what we call the annual lobotomy, uh, we should at least mitigate its impact. Sixth conclusion is to be effective, reconstruction has to be grounded on a deep understanding of the traditions and mores of the host nation. Now, beyond that, I think it's important to focus on what I call the box of broken tools. Many of the U.S. failures in Reconstruction have quite simply been the result of U.S. personnel on the ground in Afghanistan being given a box of broken tools to work with, making it impossible to accurately judge whether a program is actually achieving its objectives or not, or how it works. What you see in Afghanistan are problems with the U.S. government here in the United States. It's only on steroids when it's in a country like Afghanistan. Agencies, and one of these key things, and the Washington Post highlighted too, is the fact that agencies have frequently misled themselves, and by extension you, about success in Afghanistan. This is in part due to the short rotations of U.S. personnel. It's also part of a bigger problem. It is simple human nature that no one wants to admit that they did not accomplish their mission in Afghanistan during their six-month, nine-month, or 12-month tour of duty, whether they are a soldier or a civilian. I'm not saying that the men and women working for state or aid or DOD are all intentionally misrepresenting progress with some nefarious motive. But unfortunately, they are operating in a system that incentivizes showing progress, however ephemeral or fleeting, which may not actually be reflected in reality. We have found that many of the claims that agencies have made over time do not survive close scrutiny. For example, in 2014, the then USAID administrator stated today, quote, today, three million girls and five million boys are enrolled in school compared to just 900,000 under the Taliban, unquote. But a subsequent cigar audit found that USAID had taken few, if any, steps to verify the accuracy of any of the enrollment data. And this was an enrollment data it was receiving from the Afghan government, which was the basis of these claims, which the Afghan government itself raised doubts about its accuracy and called into question that data. And because USAID's education programs lacked any metrics, or effective metrics, I should say, aid could not even demonstrate how U.S. taxpayer dollars had contributed to the claimed improvement in enrollment. That same USAID administrator also claimed that since the fall of the Taliban, quote, child mortality has been cut in Afghanistan by 60%, maternal mortality has declined by 80%, and access to health services has increased by 90%. As a result, he said, Afghanistan has experienced the largest increase in life expectancy, and the largest decrease in maternal and child deaths of any country in the world, unquote. Yet, SIGAR's audit of Afghanistan's health sector in 2017 found that while USAID publicly re reported 
a 22-year increase in Afghan life expectancy, USAID did not disclose that the baseline it used for that comparison came from one World Health Organization report that could only make an estimate because of limited data. A later World Health Organization report, which had a broader scope, showed only a six-year increase in Afghan life expectancy for males and eight years for females, a far cry from the 22 years of that USAID claim. As for maternal mortality claims, SIGAR Audit found that USAID's 2002 baseline data was suspect since it was from a survey conducted of only four of Afghanistan's then 360 districts. Likewise, a SIGAR audit of U.S. government programs to assist women in Afghanistan found that, quote, although the Department of Defense, State, and Aid report gains and improvements in the status of Afghan women, SIGAR found that there was no comprehensive assessment available to confirm that these gains were the direct result of U.S. programs. And while state and aid collectively reported spending $850 million on 17 projects that were designed in whole or in part to help Afghan women, they could not tell our auditors how much of that money actually went to programs that supported Afghan women. Another SIGAR audit looked into the more than $1 billion that the United States had spent supporting rule of law programs. Shockingly, we found that the U.S. actually seemed to be moving backwards as time went along. Our audit found that while the 2009 U.S. rule of law strategy contained 27 specific performance measures, by 2013, that strategy contained no performance measures at all. If you have no performance measures, how can you tell if you're succeeding? Now, while honesty and transparency are always important, when government agencies overstate the positive and overlook flaws in their methodologies and accountability mechanisms, there are real implications for public policy and public perceptions of the government. As the philosopher and political theorist Hannah Arendt once said, quote, if everybody always lies to you, the consequence is not that no one, that one believes those lies, but rather that consequence is that no one believes anything any longer, unquote. If U.S. agencies are not transparent and honest about success and failure, in Afghanistan, these problems will continue to persist, meaning that many of you who are students now, when you end up working for a government or NGO or international organization in the future uh, in reconstruction or stabilization, will face many of those same problems. Uh, and that is because the skewed incentive structure that rewards quick reports of success without actual verification of whether the actual intended outcome or project or program was achieved will still be in existence. Now, you may have noticed that to paint a rosy picture of progress, agencies tend to highlight things like the number of programs they operate and the amount of money they spend as signs of success. For some of you in the room who have taken the courses on program evaluation, you know that these metrics are not the proper indicators of success. SIGAR has found time and time again in our work that U.S. agencies frequently conflate inputs and outputs with actual outcomes. As a result, inputs and outputs do not accurately reflect success or failure, and cannot show, show, which is really important in Afghanistan, the sustainability of a program over the long term. Inputs and outputs are relatively easy to measure, so U.S. agencies are really good at measuring those. Inputs, such as the amount of money put on contract and spent, and outputs, such as the number of soldiers trained, schools built, or miles of road constructed, 
have often been cited, and we note that in our CIGAR reports by U.S. agencies. Inputs and outputs, however, do not sufficiently demonstrate how a program is meeting its objectives. For example, do the soldiers we train actually fight? And do they fight well? And do they fight against the enemy and not us? Have the schools we built actually improved education? Are there actually teachers in the schools that we've built? And are they teaching the courses we expect them to teach that support the Afghan government? Have the roads we built increased economic activity? Or are they just being used by insurgents to get to some place faster to blow it up? Those, these were the goals of those projects after all. So that's what you should be looking at for whether the program was a success or not. While measuring outcomes is more difficult than measuring inputs or outputs, outcomes are the only true barometer of whether a program or project is successful in contributing to the broader reconstruction effort. For example, one of our lessons learned reports highlights the U.S. has spent over $18 billion, that's with a B, since 2002 on equipment for Afghan security forces. Unfortunately, the report also found that despite all the money spent on hundreds of thousands of weapons and tens of thousands of vehicles, the equipment was not often given to the Afghans with the proper operating and maintenance manuals. And in some instances, the manuals were in English. Now, that's OK in the United States. But in a country like Afghanistan, with a literacy rate of less than 35%, it's difficult to find any Afghan who can read Dari or Pashtun, let alone English. How can you reasonably expect the Afghan army unit to be successful if they don't even know how to operate and maintain their equipment? By focusing on the delivery of equipment, the US was missing the fact that we had not given the Afghan security forces the tools they needed to actually use that equipment. The consequences of overlooking long-term outcomes in this case could literally mean life or death to the Afghan soldier. In our report on U.S. counter-narcotics efforts in Afghanistan, we looked at the effectiveness of alternative development programs, which aim at getting farmers to grow licit crops instead of growing poppy. The report in particular examined USAID's alternative development program that rehabilitated irrigation canals. And of course, USAID talked about the miles of irrigation canals that had been rehabilitated with, I assume, the intention that this would increase arable land and would incentivize farmers to grow other crops beside poppy. But when we dug deeper and examined some of these projects, we found that the improved irrigation systems actually led to more poppy production. Near one U.S. rehabilitated irrigation canal, poppy production increased 119% over two years. No wonder that despite the nearly $9 billion with a B that the U.S. has spent on counter-narcotics, Afghanistan remains the largest opium poppy producer in the world. And the amount of illicit export dwarfs licit export. I think licit export is about $800 million, and the poppy export is anywhere from $1.2 to like $3 billion per year. Now, without measuring the outcomes of our programs, USAID and the other agencies were able to tout the amount of money they were spending and the amount of irrigation systems they were building without actually assessing whether or not these programs were reducing property production. So while identifying problems for SIGAR has been pretty easy, especially in Afghanistan, the more important question is how these broken tools can be fixed. Answer to these problems do not necessarily have to come from an act of Congress or executive order. 
To combat some of those challenges, SIGAR developed a framework for determining whether a development program or project was likely to succeed or not. We developed this framework with Afghanistan reconstruction in mind, but the questions are equally applicable to the broader development context that many of you may be involved in, as well as other public policy decision making. As a matter of fact, when we came up with these, this criteria, Congress incorporated it into a number of appropriations bills to be used by uh, uh, agencies. We call this development, this, this, this program, the seven questions. If you ever come to our office, you'll see them plastered all over the walls. These are seven questions that should be asked, and if they answered into the affirmative, that program is more likely to succeed or not in Afghanistan and elsewhere. First question is, does the project or program clearly contribute to our national interests or strategic objectives? If it does, it's more likely to succeed because it will be supported by our government. Second question, does the recipient country, in this case Afghanistan, know about the program, want the program, or need the program? If it doesn't, I doubt that program is going to succeed. And we have found many programs in Afghanistan where the Afghans only learn about a building or clinic or school that was built when we give them the keys. Third question is, has that project been coordinated with other US agencies, with the recipient Afghan government officials, and with international donors? We've seen many instances where two or three donors will build schools or clinics right next to each other. Fourth, do security conditions permit effective implementation and oversight? If the security is so bad you can't get out to see the building you're building, was the building built? And we actually uncovered that right across from the U.S. Embassy, where we spent money to build the Marriott Hotel, and it turned out it was a total Potemkin village. Only the exterior walls looked good. Inside, it looked like a bombed out building. Well, you lied, I forget how much money. Kaylin, how much did we lose, taxpayer lose on that? Was it 18 million? 83 million on that. And that was right across the street from the U.S. Embassy. And the U.S. government agency that funded it said we couldn't visit it because it was too dangerous. Now, it wasn't too dangerous for my auditors to walk across the street. And it wasn't too dangerous for the U.S. Embassy to spend send over regional security officers because after this building was after it was caught that it was a, a, a total hoax, it's now being protected by the U.S. taxpayer at great expense because it looks down right on the U.S. Embassy and its abandoned Potemkin village. Sixth question. Does the recipient government have the financial, technical, and political will to sustain the program? If not... Why are we building it? Why are we giving it to them? If they don't want it and they can't sustain it, they technically don't know how to do it. And this is a very important issue that's coming up in relationship to peace and with the Afghan Air Force, which, as you all know, when we pull out, pursuant to the peace agreement, we pull out all contractors. And the only reason the Afghan government's Air Force flies is because we're providing contractors. So the question is, why are we giving billions of dollars of airplanes and drones and other highly sophisticated things if there's not going to be anybody to maintain it? Last question is, have implementing agencies established meaningful, measurable metrics for determining success? Now, if you answer those questions, yes, there's a better than average chance you're going to succeed in Afghanistan. If not, well, you might as well, as I said lately, last time I testified before the House Foreign Relations Committee, you might as well pile up all the money on Massoud Circle and burn it for all the good it will do to the Afghans. 
Now, as you go on your future careers, you may want to be mindful of those seven questions. I think you can apply it anywhere. You could even apply it here in Syracuse. Apply it to the university. Huh, you got that building? Does anybody know about it? Et cetera, et cetera. No, I won't do that. Uh, but I think they're useful questions. In conclusion, Afghanistan is America's longest war. With over 2,300 American lives lost and nearly a trillion dollars spent not just on reconstruction, but the war fighting. And we have tens of thousands of Afghans have also lost their lives, as have many civilian and military personnel from coalition partners. But with the number of fragile states on the rise, it, is also, it also is unlikely to be the last reconstruction and stabilization efforts that the U.S. undertakes. That's my prediction. People keep telling you, nah, we're never going to do Afghanistan again. In my humble opinion, we will. So you better learn some lessons. You better learn some best practices because we will do it again. And despite the political protestations to the contrary notwithstanding, I'm going to leave you with a quote from one of my favorite historians, Winston Churchill, who said, quote, the farther backwards you can look, the farther forward you are likely to see, unquote. While Sigar's reports have often ruffled many feathers among agency officials and bureaucrats, uh, because we identify failures and missed opportunities and bad judgments. I hold it is only by identifying mistakes and errors that you find the path to improvement. The vast majority of the U.S. government civilians, soldiers, and contractors on the ground making these decisions were doing the best they could with the tools they were given in an unbelievably challenging environment. Nevertheless, it is Sigar's job to identify that the $136 billion spent on Afghanistan reconstruction by the United States worked sometimes and failed in other times, and basically could have been spent more wisely, cost-effectively, and probably could have achieved better and long-lasting outcomes uh, with less money and less time. That is why I urge you to remember this, that oversight is mission critical. For those of you who have served in the military or understand that term, it may be easy to spend $136 billion, but it is the height of foolishness to spend that much money and not attempt to learn from the things that inevitably did not work as intended, were counterproductive, or were flat-out failures. And I would say this, without an organization like SIGAR watching over them, there is very little, if any, motivation for agencies virtually, or yeah, virtually incentivized by Congress to spend their entire budget every year or every two years to highlight anything that might have possibly fallen short of their ultimate objectives. So, returning to peace, let me also conclude, when we think of peace, let me also conclude with a quote again from that great historian and parliamentarian, Winston Churchill. After the Allies' success in El Alamein in 1942, he said the following, and I think we should keep it in mind, quote, now this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. With that, I look forward to answering all your questions. Thank you very much. Do you want me just? We're going to get microphones. Oh, okay. Oh, they're up here. There's two up here.
Okay, does anybody have a question? Um, oh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. So, hello, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is Fariba Pajouh. I'm from Iran, and uh, I um, covered uh, Afghanistan for two years, like 2014 and 15. I've been there, and the last time was October 2018. First of all, I really like your pin. It's Afghanistan and uh, the U.S. flag, like this. Okay, sorry. Then, um, uh, actually, you answered. Uh, with the last quote to my question, but uh, I would like to answer it. So uh, the US, uh, uh, first of all, I agree with uh, the things you said uh, about the corruption in Afghanistan. I am a witness um, um, as a reporter, and uh, so I'm familiar with the language, so I speak mm -hmm. Farsi. Yeah. Then um, it was very easier for me to walk around and it was safe for me and to see what's going on. So I'm a witness, I agree with you, but uh, with all the fi financial and the human cost and uh, um, American lives and Afghan lives, so now um, the US is leaving um, Afghanistan and uh, giving the, the government kind of to, to Taliban. Uh, so what was the, what, what is, why? I mean, it's the question. After 18 years, what's going on? Now Afghanistan officially and, and uh, unofficially have two presidents, like from yesterday. Then, uh, so what was the reason? Just revenge Taliban because of 11 September, 11, 18, 19 years war, and now by, this is the government to you Taliban? Thank you very okay. much. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Boy, she wants to get me fired. Um, no, I, that's a very good question. And I won't be able to answer all of it because as IGs, I don't do policy. I do process. Uh, I also do a nice tap dance around things. I think a couple things you gotta keep in mind, and I, I have been doing this for a number of years, eight years or whatever. I did have to testify three times within 27 days before Congress, many congressional committees, and my staff, I talk to congressional members and staff all the time. Two things I want you to understand. First of all, why did we go into Afghanistan? The answer to that question is we went in because of the attacks on the United States. We wanted to find those bad guys who we felt did it. We wanted to punish them. And uh, we wanted to ensure that it didn't happen again. So our goal all along has been national security. We tacked on the development side to it because I think people thought, rightly, that we want to help create a government that won't let these bad guys back in again. And so we're going to do rule of law and development, et cetera. And I think that's a noble cause. And it was a, a smart to think that we could do that. Um, could we have done it better? That's what I just told you. I think we could have. We could have done it faster. We could have done it cheaper. We did so now, 18 years. You have to understand, and why I prefaced it, that I've testified and met with a lot of members. The members of Congress represent the American people. And the American people are torn. You know, we like the Afghans, we've really helped them, but it's 18 years. You know, this has got to end at some time. And that's a policy call. But I understand, and I can understand the, the tension when I see the members asking the questions. They're saying, oh my God, we don't want to desert the, Tal the Afghan people. We don't want to desert the women and the advances that have been made, and there have been some. We've spent so much money and effort. We don't want to lose that. We don't want the Afghans to hurt. But at the same time, it's been 18 years. You know, There are people now who weren't even alive in 2001 who are going over to serve. I met a general when I was over there. His kid is now going to Afghanistan. He wasn't even alive back then. So this is the tension. I can't give you the answer. I don't think, it's not our intention to desert the Afghans. It's just this thing is, at some point, enough is enough. We've done a lot. Now, that's a call above my pay grade. And, you know, we have come closer to a peace deal now 
under this administration than ever before. Now, I, I'm not involved in the peace deal, but that's what I'm being told by a lot of experts and you read in the press. So let's hope it works. I don't know if that answers the question. I can't tell you why, but understand the frustration of the American people the being there for 18 years. At the same time, they still want to help the Afghan people. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I was taken by your the seven questions, the evaluation questions yeah. you came up with. But um, if you apply it to the Afghan security forces, at least the first two questions do apply to the Afghan security forces. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can take it a step further and say, so this was identified by both parties as a, a key interest and, and highly important, and yet it's still, according to the lessons learned and everything we've seen, it's still failed. And I'm wondering if you can kind of talk about those failures and, and perhaps even the failure evaluation, or if you even agree with that assessment. Well, I don't know if this is answering your question. Um, I think something to keep in mind, and I don't know if this is where you're getting at, and I apologize, and I'll answer the question if I, I didn't understand it. You can actually come up with negative responses to every one of those questions and still fund the program. Because there may be broader public policy or diplomatic uh, reasons for doing that. Um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a program we funded called American University Afghanistan. And it's had some management problems, and we've identified them. But I can understand people in Congress and the executive branch saying that despite that fact, despite all the waste, you got to fund it because it's iconic. It's the American University of Afghanistan. You got to stick with it. I don't know if that's answering the question or maybe I'm missing the point no, on the question. Yeah, I think it's, it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Hi. So I really appreciate the talk. I, very insightful, especially on your end with reconstruction. Um, I'm sorry, I can't see you. Who's, who, oh, there you are. Okay, good, good. I just yeah, heard sure. this voice, no so, body attached, <laughs> coming to me. So I really appreciate nervous. the talk, and I felt like I learned a lot on Afghanistan reconstruction. My biggest question to you is specifically in the 18-year period. The last four years have been very in, unstable for that country. You have the appearance of former warlords coming back, not only into politics, but social settings. You have elections going on where there's going to be disputes. And on a reconstruction level, because your job is to advise and audit, how do you approach all these different departments when you are advising them what to fund, how to fund, who to communicate with? When you have people like Dotsum and Heikmar walking around and maybe not agreeing with the government agencies and stuff like that, and how does that approach change when you go into a different country who may be experiencing the same kind of situations or problems? Well, I, I don't tell and I don't leave the, I don't tell the U.S. government who they can talk to in Afghanistan and who they can't. What I tell them is, because that's a policy decision. I tell them if, for example, in our corruption report, if you fund the warlords and corrupt officials, uh, you will have consequences. You will lose the support of the average Afghan person. So just so you understand, I, I would never tell our ambassador you can't talk to XYZ people. So we do that. Um, I mean, because that's just common sense. I remember, you know, there's this old uh, mantra when I was a kid growing up. I mean, you know, if you, if you, if you go to sleep with dogs, uh, you wake up with fleas. So if you go to sleep with the warlords, you're going to wake up with problems. And that was the problem. And I would correct your question just a little bit. You said in the last four years, the uh, warlords have come back. They've never left. You know, they became senior officials. <laughs> You know, we funded them. We gave them the contracts. That's the problem. They are in, they inserted themselves. We unwittingly allowed them to take over many of the departments and all of that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's maybe not. I rephrase it again. I'll try again. Ah, now that's a good question. What we, all we can do is we can advise them that they should have a system set up that identifies the bad characters and takes it into consideration. Again, go back to those seven questions. You may still have to fund the ring road because there's greater 
importance, but at least know what the consequences are. We are not saying that we should be so pure and white that we never, you know, fund a bad person in Afghanistan, but at least understand the consequences. Okay, that's all we're saying. So, and we say that for better, better business, you, you ought to have a process set up that can identify them so you know who you're dealing with. I mean, part of this it was really frustrating is, you know, we got intelligence people who can find out who is who and who's connected to who so we can send a missile down their chimney and kill them. But we can't use the same technology to find out who is the corrupt uncle, cousin, and nephew of one of these warlords so that we don't give a damn contract to them. That's what I find so frustrating. And particularly when it comes down to, this is the issue that irks a lot of us in law enforcement, and I have judge you've had experience in law enforcement, is this that, and you did rule of law. I mean, you know, for heaven's sakes, uh, you, you, you know what's gonna happen if you give that contract to somebody and you just look a blind eye. And what it comes down to, I found over all my years and experience, as a federal prosecutor, a Hill investigator, CT always trumps CC. You know what I mean by that? Counterterrorism will always trump countercorruption. So whether you're a criminal investigator, a judge, and you'll say, we got to get this guy. He's corrupt. We got to send him to jail. We got to turn him over. Some guy who flies in from an agency with three initials, three letters, will say, oh, no. He's one of ours. I mean, I, I saw this as a prosecutor in Cleveland, Ohio. You know, we always had informants that we couldn't touch. Later I found out that everybody we were investigating was an informant for some agency. You know, so who are they informing on if everybody's included? So that's the problem. And what we were trying to do in our report on, on corruption is to elevate that corruption isn't just a law enforcement issue. It's a national security issue. And if you ignore corruption, it's a security issue, just like the counterterrorism guys do. And, and you know, we had some interesting cases where we could have indicted some big name people in Afghanistan, but he's one of ours, okay? I, I, it's frustrating because once it goes to the secret squirrels, we have no idea what happens. And, and there's nobody overlooking that. And that's what I find it's very frustrating as a former prosecutor. You know, okay, I understand intel. I've dealt with it. But, you know, classification for many years is used to hide incompetency. And I'll say this, and I know Judge, you'll agree with me. Well, I don't want to put you in that spot. Maybe you won't. That governments don't classify good news. It's as simple as that. I've been in Washington since 1982, and I've learned that thing. And if they do classify good news, they leak it. And that's the problem we face. Every time we get another indicia, look at our audits. Look at our quarterly reports. You'll see me screaming and yelling all the time like this, saying, well, hold it. There are no metrics anymore. They're all classified. Because every time they start to go south, they get classified. OK. I got off my hobby horse on that one. Hi, uh, Roberto Quijano, MPA student here. Uh, thank you for your great presentation. Thank you for that uh, great quote by Hannah Arendt. She's a great example of how sometimes telling the truth is uncomfortable. Yes. But it's our historical responsibility. Yes. So my question is, how do we deal with unintended consequences? Uh, in this case, you mentioned how in the counter-narcotic efforts in Afghanistan, resulted or had the unintended consequence of uh, increasing poppy cultivation in Afghanistan. So how do we deal with those uh, unintended consequences? Especially, like, it seems that most uh, U.S. government efforts abroad have these sort of consequences. Like, say, for example, in Colombia, uh, after the, the Blanc Colombia, cocaine cultivation is at an all-time high. Same in Peru. Or in Mexico, after the capture or extradition of uh, El Chapo, of violence is at an all-time high, and poppy cultivation and fentanyl are starting to take um, 
uh, a place in the market. So that's a very good question, and y y you got to look at each individual case. But first of all, think about what the unintended consequence could be of your action. And uh, you just have to take it into consideration. I know this isn't a good answer to you, but uh, we're just saying think about the unintended consequences of us getting in bed with the warlords was we were identified with the warlords and were used by uh, the Taliban and other uh, uh, insurgencies uh, as part of the problem. So there, there is no specific answer. I can't say. You just got to think before you do it. You have to realize that all of these programs cannot be accomplished overnight. Be honest to yourself and be honest to the taxpayer and be honest to Congress and tell them that development's going to take years and you've got to have experts who do it. And anybody who comes in, you know, like a, uh, uh, a, a, a you know, snake oil salesman, who says, I can answer the problem with this magic bullet, is lying, flat out, or he's stupid. And we have too many people walking around with magic bullets. And they'll say, or a shiny object they'll show in front of Congress or some general or something. And that's one of the things that Cigar has served a purpose. We, we, every, I've gone through six commanding generals, six ambassadors, eight or nine heads of C-STICA, which is the Combined Security Training Command Afghanistan, and every time they come in, they have another shiny object. And sometimes they say, uh, we tried that three years ago. Uh, your predecessor five years ago tried that. Didn't work. Uh, try something else. But we try to, that's part of the knowledge base. You need to use the knowledge base. I don't know if that answers your question. I can't, I can't we, there are unintended consequences. This is not gonna be easy. Narcotics, dealing with narcotics is not easy and it hasn't worked too long. But here's an example. How long did Colombia, did the peace negotiations go on? Four years. Four years. The peace agreement, if it's true, I don't know if we're holding to that, what's it, 14 months before we leave? Well, good luck. I mean, I hope it happens. I, God, I hope it happens. But 14 months, look at four years. And even in Colombia, as you, you must know something about Colombia, it, it's been sketchy. So, Yes, sir. Thank you for your time today. Uh, more of an intelligence-based question, just following along with that, like you said earlier. But in order to get a more complete picture, uh, does the inspector general and its auditors have access to those uh, to the, and capability to investigate the U.S. agencies or agencies in general that operate at the secret no foreign level or the TSSCI level? Yeah, we have, we have uh, clearances. We can see it all. So, uh, but I, because of above a certain classification level, it's very difficult to do. I worked out an MOA with uh, the intelligence IGs. We'd give them information that was useful to them, we thought, and they would do vice versa. And then more of a follow-on with those unclassified reports and documents that you've published, how does that affect the more sensitive material? I don't know what you mean. How that, that you find in uh, the failures or successes within Afghanistan. Well, when necessary, we produce classified reports. Okay. Uh, we try not to, but uh, when necessary, we do. Yeah. We actually, every quarterly, we have a classified annex now because everything's been classified. If I could, um, so first of all, I, I, I hope I'm not taking away anything from what you or Professor Odell want to say, but I just want to thank Professor Denevers and, and Professor Odell for putting together this. This is a fabulous program. I'm sure you all recognize that and for inviting you to speak here. And I, and I do specifically as an Afghanistan veteran, this means a lot to me. And I want to thank you for your efforts in Afghanistan, your willingness to share your insights with us, and probably most importantly, your willingness to speak truth to power, which very few people today, as I'm sure you know, have the courage to do, and it does take courage to do so. And to everybody who's here, I can only tell you, you got an education here that you would never get anywhere else, and now it's up to you to use the lessons learned to advance the cause of 
post reconstruction post conflict reconstruction for those of you who go into that area. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. both for all that. We, have, we do have time for just a few more questions. Sure, sure. And I'll, right? I'll try to be very short. Okay. Oh. Sure, I'll ask one. Hi, I'm Ryan Griffiths. I'm a uh, faculty member in political science here. So a lot of the students in the room are from a U.S. foreign policy class, an undergraduate class, where we think about a range of foreign policy issues, particularly intervention, nation building, that sort of thing, the conditions under which we think it'll work, where it'll be ineffective, et cetera. So you've dealt with some of these issues during your talk, uh, less from a policy standpoint, of course, from a procedural one, as, as you've said. So I guess one question that's sort of specific is, when you think about the range of different projects that you've, that you've overseen, what do you think will stick? If we imagine that a peace agreement will go through, some sort of power sharing arrangement, and then the future you, 10 years from now, is able to go and visit the country and see what has is, what is been sustained and what has maybe fallen by the wayside, what, what projects do you have hope in seeing progress and seeing them being sustained? Okay. Well, I'd, I'd go back to our seven questions. Probably those projects that the Afghans knew about, wanted, and had the capability of using and building will survive. Uh, those projects which were too big, too expensive, uh, are going to fall at the wayside because there's no maintenance. I mean, we built the ring road and we never gave them money for maintenance uh, of it, so it's going to fall apart. But some things will survive. I think. And again, I, this is the tricky part. It's hard to answer that question because we don't know how the Taliban's going to play in this. And that is the big, you know, $64,000 question. How are they going to play in that merger? But uh, because some of the programs for women, especially women's health care, women's education, I would hope they survive, I think like all of us, and I would hope the Afghan government would be able to keep it survive, but I have no idea what the Taliban's role is going to be. And that, that makes me nervous, and it makes most Afghans nervous. I mean, just so you know, I have never met an Afghan woman who trusts the Taliban to this day. And I just came back. And that's the scary part. That is, we don't know the answer to that. But I, I think smaller programs, programs that have a buy-in, I don't know in your you're teaching, do you ever study the approach that the Germans do on development aid through GIZ? It's one of our organizations. Fantastic. You ought to bring somebody in from GIZ. The Germans actually set up a private corporation that only works for the, US, for the German government to do development. But GIZ, these are all government employees, won't do the program unless they go out first and ensure that there's buy-in from the community on the program. I mean, the, the German government comes up with this novel idea, but GIZ sends people out and says, well, nah, there's no buy-in. Nobody wants it. They walk away from it. But if they do, GIZ has been more successful, I think, than many USAID programs. And it's because there's buy-in from the local community, the amount of money they have to spend on security is diminished because the local families will provide it, support. Okay. I, I'd like to try to, uh, my name is Jerry Miner, I'm an emeritus uh, faculty member. I'd like to try to uh, have you reach some generalizations here a little bit. And I'm, I'm thinking about the lessons learned uh, aspect of it. The, the lessons you learned are not very different from the lessons we learned in Vietnam, right? Good point. And, and uh, my colleague mentioned um, um, nation building. Maxwell School at one time was very interested in nation building. We were going to rebuild Pakistan and I don't think we quite made it. So my, my point here is the relationship between these procedural and process issues and policy. You, you have been suggesting, well, Policy is not your area, and so you're looking at the procedures and processes necessary to accomplish policy. But maybe we should be looking at things from the other side, that maybe the procedures and policies necessary to achieve certain policies and outcomes are not possible. We are trying to accomplish in these uh, 
nations, policies and procedures that are beyond the capacity of anyone to accomplish, and therefore we should not have policies regarding these nations that involve and necessitate these policies. I recall here maybe five or six or seven years ago, we had <coughs> one of our former Maxwell people who was a high administrator regarding um, um, uh, Afghanistan. And he came and he told us how wonderfully the policy was working, and if we just stuck with it, everything was going to be fine. At the same time, these folks at the University of Chicago, Mersheimer, and I can't remember his associate, were saying, we ought to get out of Afghanistan. We never will achieve our policies. We ought to have capacity to intervene if things were going on that were going to harm our national security. But otherwise, the policy was totally unrealistic. Yeah. I, 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 I wonder if you could sure. just try to I, I'll, I'll quickly comment. I, I, I think that's an excellent question, and I think you've identified a, uh, a problem. Uh, I can only look at process. Um, but at least somebody's looking at the process. What we really do need is we do need a think tank, uh, a lessons learned program in the State Department and USAID. Uh, but we don't. Uh, the USAID doesn't have one. The State Department has the Foreign Service Institute, which does great training, but it's not the think tank. The only people in town who have the money, uh, the time, and the effort to do lessons learned is the Department of Defense. So why do you think a lot of our foreign policy looks like it's uh, uh, done at the end of the barrel of a gun? Because it's only DOD that can do that type of research. And I think what uh, uh, Ambassador, uh, uh, what General Allen and what Ambassador uh, Crocker were getting at is nobody is doing this type of lessons learned. We really, what you're an advocate for is doing lessons learned and then getting the people who in to do the policy to read those reports or follow through. And that's one of the biggest problems. I can't force anybody to read my stuff. We get the Washington Post to do that. But anyway, you know, I, I, that's the problem. But I think you got an excellent point. We really do need somebody to sit down and do this type of analysis. Real quick question, can we do one more, or are we out of time? Yeah. Yeah. Nope, they don't. Nobody does. Got to ask them. <laughs> now, I don't want to be flippant, but you got to ask them. Hey, look, I'm a unique IG. You know, I never assumed I'd have this job after a year. I figured I'd get fired. But I, I approached the IG differently because I worked on the Hill for 20 years, and I saw what good IGs could do and what bad ones were doing. And I figured I was given a task by the White House, fix it and fix it fast, and I used every tool I could think of, every quiver, every arrow in the quiver. So doing publicity, doing lessons learned, anything that sounded good, if you look at my little shop, you know, which everybody told me, don't take this job, Sopko. Because when I got the approach, everybody said, we're putting it out of the business. It's a horrible agency. We're going to put a bullet in its head. I decided to take it because the White House asked me to do it. And you have to do this. Every IG should be doing lessons learned. And Congress should consider about creating more whole of government IGs. And I'll do this last spiel. I know I get on a soapbox because like most attorneys, I get paid by the word. Most of the problems you're facing right now and I'm facing are whole of government problems. Think about that. Think about that. The whole issue of environment. It's a commerce department. It's an EPA department. It's an environment. It, it's multiple. Think of the opioid epidemic. It's a justice department. It's a, it's a uh, health and services department. All of these major problems you're confronting, and I say you, I'm an old timer, I'm, I'm going over the hill, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm defecting to Maine as soon as I can, where I got a camp. But you guys are gonna have to deal with whole of government issues. We have set up a process where we're stovepiped. And when you go to the hill, you go to the Armed Services Committee. You know, you go to the Veterans Committee. You go to the Justice, the Ju Judiciary Committee. They're stovepiped. We got to somehow break those stovepipes. 
because the major problems you are facing now today are whole of government, and I would say, with this latest epidemic, whole of governments. Is there one person you can look at who can look at the whole of government problem with this, this plague we got? No, because we're stovepipe. Now, I'm not looking for a job. I'm, like I say, over the hill, but you ought to think about whole of government. And you here in this Maxwell House, Maxwell House, the <laughs> Maxwell School, and I think universities need to look at that. Whole of government issues. So you bring in, and I really love the fact that you bring in the law school as well as this school and looking at these problems. That is fantastic. That is forward thinking. I'll be honest with you. Because I don't see that in other schools. And I think that's forward thinking. When I go to other schools, I got to go and talk to the law school about the problem, and then I got to go over to this school, and then that school. You got to combine. That is the approach. But I'm saying it goes beyond what I do, my little work, my little kleptocracy. It deals with every issue. Your health issues, veterans, environment, those are all whole of government. Inspector General, yeah. I, uh, on behalf of the, a bribe. the Syracuse University Institute for Security Policy one. and Law, yeah? I, I, want, I want you to know what it's like to be on the receiving end of corruption. Oh, okay. uh, a small thank you. Thank you for your work, as well as for coming today to share your experiences with all of us. Mr. Kitchens, thank you very much. <laughs>